This is Tony. He will be speaking about the lockdowns. Tony was a candidate um, for West Belfast in the election. And if you'd like to talk about your opinion on the lockdown, Tony. Um, well, my whole opinion on the lockdown was basically whenever the the murmurs of the, the coronavirus were happening over in China, in around January I'd heard about it, maybe in December. Um, I didn't really take too much attention to it. I just thought it was just another type of cold or flu happening somewhere else in the world, you know. Um, but then as the media got involved a bit more, uh, came the March time, and um, I was genuinely concerned, the same as everybody else, you know. I believed everything that was on the on the news and stuff, you know, that you know, this is a deadly virus. But um quickly I realized it wasn't anywhere near as bad as what people were claiming it to be. I think it was about six weeks into it, uh, on the lockdown and um I remember going to a local pizza place and uh ordering uh, a couple of takeaway pizzas. I walked into the shop and the guard was saying to me, No, it's collection or delivery only. Um, so I found it a bit odd. So I went out in my car, got my phone, and uh, went back into the same shop and I phoned the order from. And so the girl that refused to serve me at the counter went to, and answered the phone and uh, took my order from the phone. Stan looking at me, taking my order over the phone. And um, whenever I queried this, she says, Well, this is the rules of the rules, and uh, um, I'm just following them. And then she went and goes and makes the, the pizza stand like touching shoulder to shoulder with her workmate. And, I was, and that was about six weeks when six weeks in, and I went myself, you know, this is just mad. And um, I have a health and safety background myself, you know, and the whole thing about forcing people to wear a mask and stuff like that. Like, I was in charge of the factory, in charge of several factories, actually, and um, we got best in cl class for COVID response. And um, we got a Department of Work and Pensions visit, Theresa Coffrey. We didn't implement masks in our factory, and we were the best in class in Northern Ireland. You know, the a lot of people thinking that these cloth masks work and and they didn't. The 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 gaps in them were a lot wider than the COVID particles, for example. You know, it's just the the complete useless. But you, if you were seriously concerned, you'd be wearing something's called a respirator, and you have to be clean shaven and have to be sized properly and have to have the proper filters. So there's a lot of people didn't know what they were doing, and um, the statistics showed as well that in 2020 the average deaths in Belfast ranked third out of the, the previous six years so that's it was a slap bang average year as well so it was completely blown out of proportions um the as well as that i would be what you would call a social libertarian so i would have um social values but i wouldn't be a full full-scale socialist um so it, it, what what resulted in lockdowns was was the greatest transfer of wealth that we've ever seen. Um, the, the the richest one percent made exactly the same amount of money as the the poorest ninety nine percent. It was it was just a big the transfer of wealth. Um, these pharmaceutical companies they made an absolute fortune rushing through uh, a vaccine. Um, now I'm not anti vaccine whatsoever. You know I'm all pro science. 100%. The, the issue that I had as well with um, bringing in these mandates, you couldn't get into certain shops in different countries, even more draconian measures. It should have been down to people's choice whether or not they wanted to take something. And um, for me, I just didn't want to become a, a science experiment. I wanted something to be put through the proper trials over a certain amount of years and then we find out what the what the adverse reactions are. You know, again, coming from a health and safety background, that makes sense to me. And um, suddenly you get labelled some sort of conspiracy theories because you wanted trials to happen over that period of time. Uh, it, it just doesn't make sense. And it just shows you um, the, the, the power of the media. They were getting all these people to think alike and say the same things over and over again. Oh, you're anti-vax, you're anti-vax, and you're labelled this. But you weren't. You were just, let's wait and see what the, what the results are. You know, it's, it's common sense. But unfortunately, common sense... Was thrown out the window as I was talking about the pizza place, you know, it, it just didn't exist. A couple of things are you were saying about the masks. There was a study on the Spanish flu, and it says, and it said that more people died from bacterial infections 
in the masks than from the Spanish flu itself. Do you know who the author was? Uh, I would I would guess, but I'd rather you say it for me. Dr. Anthony Fauci. Mm. And yet, after offering that paper, he still told people to go out and wear masks. And on the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, they are no, what are known as leaky vaccines. They don't stop infection and they don't stop transmission. And on the corporations making the land share of the profit, did you notice that while small and medium enterprises were told to close during the early days of lockdown, that the big chains could stay open and get their custom and as you said it had a financial and economic impact on the working class and Belfast Live reported that deprived areas were twice as likely to see a suicide increase than affluent areas and as we were were talking about uh, the affluent have smaller families and larger houses whereas the working class have larger families and smaller houses so bringing them all in this a small enclosed space um doesn't make sense if you're looking at at it from a virological point of view yeah and i was going to say medical economics reported on the john hopkins university paper which stated that lockdowns did not save lives so what do you make of that i know it didn't save lives uh, as you say the increase in suicide rates and it's going to be a legacy issue as well i mean theresa theresa may she done a study in 2014 and um it was it was determined that poverty kills, and um, there was a the difference between the richest areas and the poorest areas in England was I believe seven years for men and five years for women, the difference in life expectancy, and it's interesting that um, there was a, there was a, a a report there recently out of six hundred and fifty areas in the UK, West Belfast uh, ranked six hundred and twenty nine in terms of life expectancy as one of the worst areas out of six hundred and fifty. In the, in the whole of the UK and we are ranked third for uh, uh, we're, we're, the, we're the third most depraved area in the UK and number two for child poverty as well and um, that that's not just down to lockdown um, as well. that's that's down to um, politics really um, I, I don't want to go into too much because obviously that's not the topic that you want to discuss tonight but it's the down with the, the policies I believe of the, the people running West Belfast for decades and um, and that same party's being in power but, but they years. but they have their cars and mansions so they are quite callously apathetic to the needs of their constituents and as you said um, both professional Sinn Féin and the Social Democratic Labour Party have failed this constituency consistency or consistently. And um, you said about the long term effects on the families and children community. And I did a survey which found that um, there was physical detriments. Um, mental health adversity and learning loss from the lockdown and it found that all of those will affect the people's development in the long term Mm -hmm. and when you were saying there this isn't just a short-term detriment it's long-term adversity and do you believe a professional Sinn Féin Social Democratic Labour Party, or people before profit, or anyone um, likely to win in this constituency um, have the motivation and 
the policies to address these issues? Um, the, the policies and motivation, I don't think people actually vote on policies anymore, to be honest with you. Um, if you imagine Sinn Féin, what they stood for 10 years ago, to what they stand mm. for now, they're, they're, they're not policy ways entirely like each other. I mean, 10 years ago, you could argue that they were a, a nationalist party. Um, right mm. now, they're, they're an EU globalist party, so they are. And um, it's funny, like, there's a, there's a local office manager for the local MLA in Lagmore. And um, he was selected as a councillor because the, the previous councillor had to retire. So he's on 15 and a half grand there as a local councillor and he's getting 40 grand a year as an office manager. He's 22, straight out of university, he's never worked actually a day in his life. And, and he's getting 55 grand a year? 55 and a half grand a year, plus he gets a company phone from the council and whatever other benefits and stuff he gets. So he's, at, he's in around close to 60 grand a year. And uh, he's 22 years of age and never worked a day in his life. Um, you couldn't make this party up. I mean, they're the richest party in Europe and they've got the poorest supporters in Ireland. And uh, again, the, the difference between the, myself and the Sinn Féin and people for profit, those guys are claiming to take an industrial wage. But what people don't actually realise is that the, um, they donate to their party. So they get a tax break, so they don't, they don't get taxed their full wage, and so they donate to their party, and then their party gives them other wee benefits from it. Um, I have a fam, I have a family member who was um used to be a chief bodyguard for Jerry Adams, and he used to get a car, brand new car, give them them every couple of years. Um, y you know. So like, these are just tax write offs and exploiting yeah. the loopholes that are there. Yeah, and then there's I actually done a freedom of information request as well. For all the community groups and charities, who which politicians are directors of them, and you, you want to continue on what was it the provisional Sinn Fein member taking quite a substantial wage while they don't serve the Poglass and Twinbrook and Lagmore community, wasn't it? Yeah, but well, he's the office manager for uh, the MLA for for Lagmore. So, so he, he's 22 years of age and he's um he, he just went to university basically and came out of university and, and got given this job before that he was he's in charge of the Cynthia and youth he was president of them so, so obviously he's been um selected along the way and i do believe that he was sent over to zurich to do the young leaders uh training uh over in zurich as well which we all know is george soros is funded um the wef as well yep that was over and in Open societies, as you were referencing there. Yeah, so basically before he got selected to be the replacement councillor, I actually turned around on the post publicly and I says, uh, you're going to be the next selected councillor. And I think his family came on and says, well, oh, how do you know what? You know more than us. And, and then um, several months later it happened and I turned around and I says, I told you so. So, um, um, but then, sure. The Telegraph, what they're going to do, and then they act affronted once you tell people they've just yeah. telegraphed what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe they shouldn't have given the clear signal if they didn't want people speculating. I, I, I don't know. They're just so transparent, basically. And um, I say I have like, I had family members there um, who were, uh, you know, uh, senior enough with them. You know, I, I know a wee bit more. Then probably most there was um there was a local lady here who allegedly got her life savings stolen and um it was actually a quite senior Sinn Féin member who had put money in her house and he had, had masking and a few others stand outside and, and in front of the cameras and all saying Paul well, or that? Alex? Uh the one the MP one. Um That's Paul. Paul. Aye. Uh, Alex Alex is the was used to be the speaker at Stormont. And, and uh, the mayor. Yeah, and apparently he got caught a few times at Primark with light fingers back in the day <laughs> as well. So, yeah, they're a, a party of rogues, so they are. But um, basically, um, I've been I've been putting election posters up lately in the Lagmore area, and um, at George Soros, Fotel Sinn Féin, George Soros, and <laughs> um, the, <clears throat> as soon as I've been putting them up. Basically, the first day, um, the local MLA in Lagmore, <clears throat> he got a phone call and he came down and he, whenever I went around the corner, I came back, they were missing. Mm. And then 
um, I'd done the whole area and then I checked from the start again and every single post I'd put up had been taken down. So I went back around the whole area again and then on the third occasion, um, the there was a canvasser I'd spoken to earlier and um, I caught actually caught him on the third occasion taking mine down, going back in his car. So, you know, they're, they're just, just pure fascism, basically. They just don't want any political opposition whatsoever. So they don't. So. And... It is well you noted that um, I believe the lockdown was a merger of corporate power and state power and Benito Mussolini defined that as fascism and on open societies and professional Sinn Féin. Sure, they were vocal about re- repeal as soon as open societies started spending during that referendum also as you rightly pointed out provisional Sinn Féin used to style itself as the nationalist party yet uh, they increase the numbers of um, non-Irish migrants to Ireland and how does that help the working class Irish worker Um, it doesn't because the more people you bring in, that's a surplus in the demand for labour, and it's a limited number of jobs. So you can basically, from the corporation's perspective, you can decrease the pittance that people are trying to live on, and yet you'll still have more applicants because it's such a large pool of potential labour and this is what I don't get get about professional Sinn Féin what is wrong with Ireland for the Irish this I cannot understand Um, Brits out everyone else in that's not national sovereignty or self-determination yeah I mean I've always been clear um, I don't mind genuine asylum seekers and saying that you know if um, if a country's at war halfway across the world it makes more sense for those people to move to a, a country beside them because it shares their culture language qualifications and things like that it doesn't make sense to travel halfway across the world to, to come in my opinion but in saying that genuine asylum seekers I think should be looked after but you know, there's something like 4,000 people on the waiting list in West Belfast alone, and there's so many homeless. I would argue that people that are homeless and people that are struggling with their food, electricity, heating, they should also be given the same rights as genuine asylum seekers and be putting in the same hotels. You know, so I'm not saying kick people out that are genuine. I'm just saying everybody should be treated equal. Um, you know, the... I don't know what's became of them. The, the, their posters have changed as well to the royal blue. So mm-hmm. they are what is an EU colour and um, obviously royal blue, their um, allegiance to the king now. So they've completely sold out to what they used to stand for. And um, I, I know you and I, we would probably slightly differ. I mean, not to put words in your mouth, but you would cl- probably class yourself as a socialist, um, where I would be a social libertarian. The, the difference is in my opinion anyway um i would look after working class people however um most socialist countries they don't believe in um private property whereas you know i've had some ideas where um housing for example you mentioned they're homeless what, what i would do is we are paying for housing executive rents on properties that are 100 plus years old and for me that's not a public asset that's a public liability and that, that means the taxpayers paying the um the the money for run down housing run down. yeah so what i would propose is that once the houses are paid off then the tenant is given these so they are given an asset but but in effect we are removing a liability from the uh, northern irish taxpayer um so it's actually given more private property not let, not not doing away with private property and it doesn't cost a penny more to the taxpayer. What you're going to do there is instead of uh, paying rents of properties that are well paid off, that money that was previously spent 
is now put the SA to a building boom. So we're now we're redirecting the same taxes to put the built in brand new homes, which are um, better U value, which is better insulation, you know, um, lower cost to people. Um, so it'll create jobs, bring in more taxes. And I, by creating a built in boom, you're going to um, increase the number of housing stock. And you can potentially then have that argument about bringing in more genuine asylum seekers and things like that as well. So it's, it's a far better model. Um, or the socialist avenue doesn't work in terms of it doesn't believe in private property. I'd flip it. I would go, no, we should actually be given the people the uh, the private property. We should be giving it to them. And it's not a burden on the taxpayer then, you know. Uh, a couple of things there. You were saying about private property and the housing. I would say there's a difference between personal property and private property and i would say the house a home a residence is definitely falls under how our personal property as i would say coming from a socialist perspective um private property is property you can leverage against the people and you can restrict access to it whereas personal property is the personal possessions you have acquired for, for your own labor. But on the housing stock, as you said, that could be, you can give people assets while taking the liability off the taxpayer. But um, another thing on the housing policies, like after um, Thatcher sold off the council houses, okay, you were giving the people assets and home ownership, but you never replaced the social houses and the council houses. So that's why the new builds are needed. And on the socialist versus the market solution, um, America ha has tried the market solution. Their homelessness is increasing and the home ownership is decreasing where in china home home ownership is higher and it's still increasing and homelessness is decreasing do you want to just respond to what i said there tony yeah no problem you um you, you i'm not sure if you fully understand my political stance but I actually agree with you, um, which you might be surprised to hear. I um, I sort of have a bit of a sweet spot between the left and the right, in my opinion. I agree, told you, Maggie Thatcher, the, the, the problem with capitalists and, and uh, the Tories, they do cuts and they don't replace the services. And it's brutal, especially on the working class. Um, that's why whenever I was mentioning about my housing policy, the money is earmarked to build new properties. So it doesn't cost the taxpayer a penny more. You're just redirecting the funds to a building boom. So um, the same was down south. Fina Gale um, used to be called the Blue Shirts. So those guys, like they are. like Royal Blue like, again. <laughs> yeah. But, well, they used to be far right, but I think they've turned globalist as well. But, you know, they're, they're, they've created a tax haven, basically in the south, which I actually agree with. I, I think Northern Ireland could be a, a tax haven. Um, but um, but at the same time, I would offer the working class a tax cut. So it um, whereas Fianna Gael, it's a tax haven plus they're heavily taxing their people. Uh, and then the toll roads down south. I'm not sure if you've ever uh, drove to, through Dublin. That oh, often it's but, a nightmare. It, it, I worked in Dublin for a while, and um, it was like twenty pound a day just toll roads. Um, but I, I wouldn't be against private businesses uh, as in trying to build brand new roads down there. But as soon as the as soon as the roads are paid off, plus something like ten percent profit, you know, then them told to be completely removed. You know what I mean? So there there is a there is a balance. I but I would argue um, capitalism is cruel, uh, especially to the working class. But I would equally say that full blown socialism. Has also failed throughout history, and um, yeah, you know, 
the, the, the problem of taking over public ownership of everything, really what you're going to uh, encourage there is state totalitarianism, where the state dictates to the people how are best to run um, different things. You China, for example, um, where they took over farms from successful farmers for decades and uh, replaced it with, with people. Um, and as a result, millions of people starved. Um, same thing happened in Ukraine, the socialist government in the 30s. They actually confiscated the food and they had to put uh, posters out saying, remember it's wrong to eat your children. The, they done that also in uh, the Red Army controlled Russia whenever um, they, uh, they kicked out the Bolsheviks. So, so full-blown socialism and uh, the full-blown capitalism for me doesn't work. And uh, I, there is a balance. C certain things like the NHS, absolutely, there should be public, that should be public and should be well-funded. Um, I would be a bit different. I would have sort of out of the box solutions for people. So, take for example the rate spills. Um, Sinn Fein and Alliance and DUP voted to increase the rate spills in Belfast Council by eight percent. Um, I would have been actually fighting to reduce people's rate bills by a considerable amount. Um, one of the reasons why they increased it by so much is because they wanted to fund uh, Fenophobal in the park, um, which is all their mates, wolf tones, and everything else. So it's a you know it's so a pain in the backside every August is what mm -hmm. or is what it is. But um a couple of things on on socialism, I would say the People's Republic is the uh, has recently overtaken the United States as the biggest economy. So I would say that's not a failure when it has the most state owned enterprises in the world. Also on the what was it the cultural revolution um, in, in Ukraine or Russia? Um, no, I'm not in China. When oh, right. basically, I would say the landlords were being aggressive towards their tenants, and they were also back in the Kuomintang, which is like the Chinese Nationalist Party. And I think they're in opposition in Taiwan now. But on Ukraine, I would cite two works, um, Stalin's Peasants and Peasants' Rebel. And quite frankly, the Kulaks stole grain, hoarded grain, burned grain, and attacked those who opposed them. And even Western Sources which aren't pro-Soviet by any stretch of the imagination have said, yeah, this contributed to the starvation and the um, death toll. And you were saying about the NHS, that's something that I didn't get about the lockdown, the vaccine mandate, the masks. If they'd really cared about our health, they'd have... Um, Noticed that the Not Fall Trust um, said that um, the six counties' health service was 20 million in a shortfall, and that was before not lockdown in October 2019, I believe. And there was a staff shortage of a hundred thousand, and that came from the Health Foundation at the start of the lockdown. So if they were really concerned about health and not about corporate profits and authoritarian state control, as you said, then why didn't they make up that shortfall and train and hire 100,000 staff prior to the um, pandemic? Okay, so two things. Number one, you mentioned China being a successful government or society economy. I just want to remind you that you're a socialist and you're promoting a successful economy. For me, um, a better gauge of people's um, success is the happiness index. And you just have to look at three countries, more Scandinavian countries, sort of libertarian. Um, I think I think it's um, Norway is the highest or Denmark, one of the two. Um, yeah, so I would, they were, I would have to check that. So I would... So that, that would be a better indicator for me that the happiness index shows a successful country, not the economy. Um, basically, China, it's, it's a bit of a slave nation. Um, 
the other point that you were mentioning there, um, remind me again, what was it you were mentioning? So, oh, the NHS. The yes. NHS. <clears throat> so, again, my lefty coming out of me. So, what I would do um, to, to help promote getting the more people in to the NHS, I would actually be pushing for training of nurses and doctors and bringing back MVQ stage training for nurses as well. And I would be looking to publicly fund their training. Um, for but, nurse reasons, stuff like that? Well, here it, it wouldn't be in that particular way. So what I, what I would be proposing is that these people have to work for the NHS for a certain amount of years to pay off their debt through time rather than money. So what that would do there is that would stop people leaving to go to the private industry or moving abroad, you know, so it stops the brain drain. So again, um, a bit of a sweet spot. Bit of my lefty coming out of me again, saying, mm -hmm. "Right, we'll we'll pay for your studies, but your social contract is that you must then have to work for the NHS." So that that, that allows the staffing, but they have the freedom there to, to buy out the student debt if they want with money, and then they can. So they have the freedom there to, to move off to the private as well, or once they work forty hours a week or whatever it is, then they can they can work in the private as well. So it, it gives people the flexibility and the freedom, but also it helps the poor and society to get the training. Um, they, they pull themselves up, you know. Um, it was the same thing was mentioned about the rates. Um, I would drastically reduce people's rates bills, but what I would be proposing there instead was give people the opportunity to maybe to go out and do litter picking or um, there could be like a lollipop man or woman. You know, p people, you could go, right, you can work X amount of days um, in your community instead of paying your rates bill. So instead of paying my money, you, you could go, right, I'm going to give so many hours or, or days, and then once it's paid off, you're paying it off. So it's saving the taxpayer and the rates pair because they're not costing them, but they're, you're still maintaining the same level of services. So that's the that's where the flaw of, of capitalists and co conservatives go, you, you know what I mean? But then it's giving people the, the freedom to pay with money or pay with their time. You know? On the NHS... Um, did the, the Tories um, ever train the tens of thousands of nurses and doctors and medical staff that Boris promised, or was he just too busy par partying and bullshitting us and on the rates? Well, I know a way that um, revenue couldn't just be blundered away. We could stop with the extravagant wages as you said that 22 year old never worked a day in his life he could st st we could stop that stipend and spend it on actual council work and there, there's another thing stuff like the westicles the balls on the falls it's an eyesore on broadway and it has no function functional value Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm starting for council action here in May, and on my, I've I've done six points, and uh, on the six points, um, giving my money back to the community is, is number one. So I'm not going to take a wage at all, because it's only a part time position, two evenings a week. I'm going to be, I get, I I'm in a decent enough job, so I don't, I'm prepared to give all the way, and um, I'm also giving away part of my wages at the moment to a local community group that I set up which, um, again, based on the twin spires, but I have absolutely no say in hearts run. So it's sort of showing people a better way of how these community groups should be run. They should be run by the people, not the parties. Um, the balls and the falls, I don't know. If it's a private enterprise or whatever else, crack on. But I, I agree with you, it's a, it's a waste of public funds. And the the Lord Mayor's photo, uh, painting, you know, I can't remember, was it £30,000 that... Um, uh, Sinn Féin and £25,000 to Sinn Féin. Um, go ahead. No, I was just saying that the, the, the amount of money that they paid out for portraits, £30,000 I think it was. You know, if that was me, I'd be getting some kid off the street to do it for me. And, uh, you know, it's ridiculous. Like, absolutely ridiculous. There's just a slap in the face of spending our money. I think the Belfast City Council are tens of millions in debt. And when you consider all the waste, is it any wonder? Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah. as you said, it's going to be passed on to the rate payers to bail them out mm -hmm. instead of being 
fiscally responsible and frugal with people's money. It's the rates pairs. It's not like they're funding it off their own back, as you said. Mm -hmm. See, what it really is, uh, what I've discovered through these Freedom of Informations, it's about taking money from our pockets and putting it into the politician pockets. That's what it's really about. And, uh, and and to their friends' pockets as well, who are influential, can help them get elected. You see, what we're doing in the background, I'm part of a wee group, um, the meet all over Northern Ireland every day of the week. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're going to, but basically what we want to do is we want to set up where each area are in charge um, of their own policies, basically. And um, there's no there's no party whip. So we, we're going to create a party uh, in name only, but it's it's going to be uh, independence and ag. That's what's the, the name of it. So we want this each area to be represented by the people that pick their representative, and their representative policies are unique to each of their own areas. So we do. So um, party politics doesn't serve the people. The party politics puts the party first, the corporation second, and the people last. Whereas if you um, remove whips and you, you actually hold people to account, there's, there's nowhere to hide behind. And um, it, it's just failing us, you know. Whereas with the whip system, you can always say, I wasn't voting on conscience. I was voting with the party line. Yeah. But what sort of backbone do you not have to, to not stand up for your own values and morals? Like you're literally putting your job before what you actually came into politics that for. You know, you're there to represent your people in your area. You're not there to represent the party. You know, it, it doesn't work. You I know? remember the media, when media gave Corbyn a lot of crap when he voted against Blur from the back benches and it wasn't just on the Iraq war. They branded him disloyal. Yet when people defied Corbyn from the back benches and defied the Labour whip then, they celebrated. I think it shows who was doing the bidding of the corporations and I believe that was Tony Blair 100%. Mm -hmm. Like, it just so happened that the oil corporations who donated to him prior to the Iraq war benefited greatly after the intervention and that's something else that i forgot to say when you were saying about genuine refugees and asylum seekers a way to stop the push factor would be not to send warships and missiles out there to begin with yep. and also um international law has a specific definition of refuge and asylum and it's so someone who seeks refuge or asylum in the nearest safe country and that's the thing ireland isn't the nearest safe country to any ongoing conflict or war zone and there's sixty four thousand ukrainians in ireland but this is the thing north africa is literally closer the Ireland than Ukraine it is the Ireland. Mm -hmm. that, was my po that was my point. You know, if uh, somewhere's a war, you don't travel halfway around the world to put them in somewhere else. It doesn't make sense. We don't have the same culture, language, qualifications. Um, their family support network isn't beside them. So it doesn't make sense, you know. Also, they've travelled literally from one end of the continent through all safe countries to come here mm -hmm. so the it's not like they didn't have a chance to settle down and it's not like they would have been within range of the conflict at all yeah like it, it's you, such a, it's such a hot topic because if you talk about it at all you're branded some sort of far-right racist and, and you're not i mean three quarters of the world do a points-based migration system like three quarters, you can't get into Canada, America, Australia, New Zealand. You can't, you know, and nobody bats an eyelid. But if you say, oh, we need to do the same here, 
you know, I, I would have been on the other side of the argument six years ago. I would have said, no, bring in as many people as we want. Because again, uh, you know, like I do have a conscience and, a, you know, I, um, I would have been historically centre left, would have been moved far right, according to the, the media and how it is. But, um, you know, was one way when I write on the wee bit more research, I realised that uncontrolled migration, it's actually communism for the poor and capitalism for the rich. You know, it's uh, the only people who benefit is the multinational companies that are that are making all the money out of the, the cheap labour, and it's the working class areas that it will actually be disproportionately affected. You know, so it's it's a calculation for me. It's it's based on the ho- available housing stock and, and the and available job market for me. That's the way the um, it should be looked at. And again, looking at the housing policy, which I was mentioned about before that would increase the number of houses and then we could have an argument about bringing up bring like raising the limits you know but um when there's four thousand homeless in west belfast you know we're ready in a deficit you know that's true but you've just reminded me of a few things you said about far-right racists have you checked the ideologies of the ukrainians (laughs) <laughs> yeah, step, step, step on Bandera, like a literal Holocaust perpetrator there, and that he is seen as a national hero there. Also, that's something people said at the start of the special military operation by Russia. Vladimir Putin just solved COVID and the housing crisis. Yeah, because yeah. and that's something I know. Uh, stark contrast I noticed basically uh, was that the Syrians it was okay to screen them for radical Islamic Wahhabi beliefs but when the Ukrainians were coming why didn't we screen them to see if they leaned towards national socialism like it's um it's it's again all about money um, it's European resettlement fund money, so you're bringing people in, and there's money available, and there's all these NGOs that are funded. And um, again, if they're running the NGOs, they're running the money coming into their communities, and because they're bringing people in, then they can get them on the voting register and uh, getting guaranteed their votes because they're the ones helping them get set up and all. It's it's just about money and about control, and the everyday people are just being um, it's just feeding on this mainstream media and falling for it. Hook, hook, and center, you know. Uh, I, you know, I watch the Ukraine on fire. Like, I know that the U- Ukrainians, there's a lot of uh, Nazi um, elements to it. Um, it was political. It, 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 2014, they, they got rid of the Russian supporting president and the, the, the brought in Zelensky. Victor, there. Victor Yanukovych, it was. Uh-huh. So the, 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 that's a political move. And they actually demand John Kerry in America, tried to do it um, roughly about 10 years ago in Turkey as well. He tried to do a military coup in Turkey because it's seen as... The Gulenists. Uh-huh. So um, there's moves and counter moves happening behind the scenes. And, um, like, it's okay for people like ourselves. We're awake to it all. We can see what they're doing. They're playing chess. But most people just go, oh, he's a bad guy because the TV told me. You know, (laughs) so... You know, I would be very much in favour of um, Ireland, North and South should have its neutrality. You know, we shouldn't be getting involved. And I, I do think we should be neutral on it completely, you know. Um, the, you were mentioning as well before, um, the, where you stand politically would be that obviously you, you're an Irish nationalist and that's where you, you would see yourself as, whereas I would be a wee bit more pragmatic in that I'm call myself Northern Irish. Um, for the record, I don't mind anybody whatsoever. I'll actually defend people that are Irish nationalists the same way as people that are see themselves as British. You know, for me, there's no, there's no difference between like a, a Republican celebrating his background. Um, they're, they're allowed to and I'll defend every right. And the same as the British, they're, they're entitled to their background. But well, I would be very much in the, in the mindset that Northern Ireland will eventually join the South. You know, it, it, it is inevitable. And coming from a nationalist background myself, in my heart, would I love to see it? Yes, I, I would, because th- that's that's who we are. But, and, but 
what I want to try to build is um, a new a new system, basically in Northern Ireland, a new model where um, each area is run by the local representatives there. So it's a bit like a super council. So that would guarantee unionist areas would have a unionist voice in their culture and everything is respected and defended. And I think from if I was on your position, I would be promoting that model because you'll find that they'll, uh, in the future, they, they would buy into something like that eventually. Um, whenever the, you know, I think it'll take about 40, 50 years before it'll happen, like, but um, I would like to see a decentralized system in place where um, every area basically is, is like a super, super council. So. Are you familiar with the political document, po political po po or the policy document, um, Aranu? Mm, no, not really. It's, I think it's been um, Republican policy since the 1970s. And basically, it's similar to what you're describing. Well, there's this the plan is a federal parliament and then provincial parliaments, Ulster, Leinster, Munster, Connacht. And of course, there's going to be Par Shern in the Ulster province. And basically, it goes to the councils and basically decentralizes and devolves power to a small a local community organization as possible. Yeah, I agree totally. And, and I that reminds me of what Vladimir Lenin said, all power to the workers' councils basically get while the soviet union did become over centralized towards the end the original idea was um get power as far away from the center as possible yep. just give it the um basically local representatives who know the local area as you say Absolutely. and that's I think that's kind of the idea on the independence, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Basically, the constituents know what the issues um, in the constituency are. So basically, they're in the best place to highlight them and push them and get solutions to the problems. But... Um, I was going to say, um, is there anything else we haven't covered on the lockdown? Do you... no, but, well, I I was very sort of, you know, lockdowns for me was literally just about um, the government overreach. You know, they, they overstepped um, the remit. They shouldn't have basically became a totalitarian uh, megalomaniacs. You know, they just went power hungry, power crazy and overreacted and unfortunately we're going to see the results of the the poverty and the inflation um for the next load of decades anyway i think we're going in for i think we're going to be in for the world of recessions coming around the, around the corner um i personally am looking to sell my house and uh go completely off grid be self-sufficient as possible um the last recession i sold my house at the peak because i seen it coming again uh -huh. and, uh, so it's the same thing the ratings on the wall like I was telling people two years ago, sell your business, and people were laughing at me. Um, and there's businesses closing now, you know, the dozen every day. You know what I mean? That's I don't know, but some people just can't see what's what's blatantly obvious in front of them. You know, as you were saying about people's businesses, that goes back to what I was saying about the lockdown. The big corporate chains got to stay open and get custom, but the small and medium enterprises had to close and the custom may have never recovered and came back it yeah. may, may have never been the same food food fault but the belfast trust um found that lockdowns led to um a lack of exercise isolation um the negative mental health effects and it negatively changed people's behavior and it had 
a disproportionate effect on disabled people. So basically people on personal independence payments who had it difficult enough, um, basically got it even worse during the lockdown and it negatively affected people's finances. It caused learning loss and an increase in domestic violence. Is there anything you'd like to say before we wrap this up, Tony? Um, the only, well, what I would say is um, there's a lot um, of misinformation out there regarding what we're trying to do, and, and particularly myself. You know, you got down since town news, they've done two stories on me. It's just basically painting you in a, a picture because that's what they want to. That's what they want to promote. You know, I had somebody who went off and um, out canvassing for people before profit. He just done a complete hatchet job of me. And, um, you know, I think we're talking with me now tonight, Eamon, you can see I'm pretty balanced and um, I'm not this mad conspiracy theorist. You know, it's just, mm-hmm. all, it's just all facts that we're talking at the end of the day. And um, I just want people to realise that there's nothing wrong with wanting to be an Irish nationalist. And from the unionist point of view, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be British, you know. Uh, it's it's working together is what we need to do and um the fact that Sinn Féin for example our policies have completely flipped uh, in the last 10 years I want people to wake up and realize that they're voting for a political party they're not voting for Man United or Liverpool <laughs> they don't owe them their allegiance it's they're there to represent the people and given the, the facts that they've failed West Belfast for so long Sinn Féin, SDLP and People for Profit it is time for change and it's time for people with fresh ideas um, and who genuinely care about the people and will be held to account. And um, that's what we are building in the background and that's what we will achieve eventually. We will be here for everybody and um, we we'll, we'll want to make this place better. I would just say that regardless if it's working class nationalist areas or working class unionist areas, there is a lot of room for improvement of people's economic living conditions. Anyway, I hope this is the first of many discussions, Tony. Uh, I hope to see you again. Appreciate it, Eamon. It was a, a pleasure. And um, anytime at all, um, love to get on again. Thank you. <laughs>